This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Thank you very much. It's often the case uh, that the analysis of a locality provides a case study through which a more widely applicable model of historical process uh, and transformations can be developed, a model which could then be tested in other localities. Now, the borders of the English shires or counties appear to present an ideal framework for such a study, uh, enclosing a territory that's neither too small nor too big, but just right. Um, today I'll take Staffordshire as just, a case, as just such a case study, and I'll explore its potential for developing a broader understanding of landholding um, in the two centuries either side of the year 1000. Now, of course, one of the risks of looking only within the boundaries of a single shire is that one tends to focus on the picture at the expense of the frame. But the frame, uh, in this case the Shire boundary, was itself established during the period I'm focusing on tonight. So I'll also be considering how the creation of the Shire and its constituent sub-territories, the hundreds, related to patterns of landholding in this particular locality. Now the problems I'm looking at tonight have been um, well introduced in past scholarship, much of it recent. Essentially, historians have been driven by a desire to develop an explanation of the patterning of landholding that, that can be reconstructed from documentary sources of the 10th and 11th centuries, most notably, of course, Doomsday Book, in particular because the pattern appears to have lasted subsequently, at least in broad outline, for many centuries. I'm going to begin uh, by reviewing just a very small part of that recent scholarship because it sets up a particular problem that I want to look at today. So in 2005, uh, Stephen Baxter and John Blair published an article about royal patronage and land tenure in the late Anglo-Saxon period. They suggested that uh, patterns of different types of land tenure might indicate conscious management and planning on the part of the king and his officers. In their case study, which was Bampton 100 in Oxfordshire, they identify four ter territorial elements to this pattern which are on the screen here. Uh, first, a royal core uh, at the centre, a core estate, um, usually a very large estate. Second, uh, surrounding that core, a zone of book land, that is, land granted by charter uh, to favoured nobles and churches. Third, a zone of uh, so-called comital land, that is, estates held by the local earl on an ex officio basis. And fourth, a zone of what they called ministerial land, similar to the comital land, um, but in this case granted to more lowly servants of the crown, of various kinds, but conveniently labelled with the catch-all title of thane. A major point of their argument is that the comital and ministerial lands were um, what's called loan lands. That is, they were held dependently from the king in return for service and might be taken back again and granted to somebody else. They were not owned outright by the Earl or Thane in question. Now, loan lands uh, might be book lands, um, one of the other zones in the, in the, in the model. Book land, so-called, originated in grants of land to the church uh, in the 7th century in England. And the current consensus is that it was originally intended to remove land from the claims of normal inheritance customs, uh, making it freely alienable, so that the monasteries and cathedrals founded upon it might last forever, as, as was the intention, without getting caught up in tenurial squabbles perpetuated by the families of the original donors of that land. And from the end of the 8th century, book land was also granted to secular lords as a reward for service. It could also be loaned temporarily by whoever held it, uh, whether secular or religious, and so, as I said, it could uh, also be loan land. Now, the scholarly consensus on Anglo-Saxon land tenure contrasts book land with something called folk land. This was land that was subject to the normal inheritance customs, but it too could be loaned out by the current holder. Um, so loan land as a type could cover book land and folk land. In distinguishing a specific um, zone of bookland, Baxter and Blair are saying that the rest um, of the hundred, the royal corps and the comital and ministerial lands, was folkland. 
What's more, the comital and ministerial zones were royal loans, meaning that most of the hundred outside, um, outside the bookland was royal folkland. The king, therefore, had control of most of the land in the hundred, in their example, and doled it out in a coordinated and planned way, so the argument goes. Now I'm going to contrast this model with some observations made by Tom Williamson in a recent book about the early medieval landscapes of the second item there. Williamson links agricultural considerations such as different types of soils and the regional variability of climate to the distribution of so-called soak men or free men recorded in Doomsday Book. Such landholders are identified uh, in the book by various different formulae they are said to have held freely, or to be able to go with their lands where they would, or simply to be free men. The current consensus, again, is that this means the landholders did not um, hold his or her land dependently from another in exchange for rent or for some other service, and that they could commend themselves to any lord they chose, rather than being obliged to commend themselves to a particular lord because of the land they occupied. They were basically not holders of loan land, although whether one can tell from the Doomsday text whether they held folk land or book land is still debated. Now Williamson's argument is nuanced, and I won't go into it uh, too much here, but a fundamental point is that uh, a drier climate favoured both the proliferation and the survival of greater numbers of freely held lands in the east of the country the density of their distribution reaching a maximum in East Anglia and Lincolnshire, as you can see from this uh, distribution map here. He doesn't have much to say about the workings of royal patronage, instead making a case for agricultural success on more easily worked soils as a prime driver in the patterning of tenure. In particular, the ability to reliably sustain a household able to merit recognition by the landholder's peers in the local hundred court. So, can these two perspectives then, that of Baxter and Blair and that of Williamson, be reconciled? In Baxter and Blair's model, Bampton 100 didn't have many free landholders at all, as most were holding loan land from the king. So can their model be modified to take account of free tenures, the free tenures that feature so much in Williamson's uh, model? I should certainly at this point mention the work of David Roth as well. Um, his work has included the suggestion that kings use the institutions of hundred and shire to reorganise the free men of different regions into groups that could be more easily tapped for an increasing number of royal dues and services demanded in the later Anglo-Saxon period, such as uh, the Geld, for example, or various forms of military service. But much still remains to be worked out about how this might have worked, and in particular how royal patronage might have engaged with, varied, with different and varied conditions on the ground. So today I'm going to use Staffordshire then as a case study by which to compare the, the Baxter-Blair model, if I can call it that, and the Williamson model. Staffordshire is a useful county for this purpose as it contains both significant royal and comital uh, estates, estates owned by the earls, as well as some held by the local bishop and many freely held estates as well so it can therefore be analysed through the lens of both models. The county is also positioned towards the western edge of the distribution of free tenures. If I go back a couple of maps, you can see Staffordshire here. It had a much smaller population than areas to the east and south, and it's therefore possible that historical processes might be discerned more clearly in such a locality where there were less people, less densely settled, uh, uh, which might therefore present less complexity. I'll now take Baxter and Blair's territorial elements in their model one by one, uh, so those zones that I introduced earlier, and present the nature of their patterning in Staffordshire to see if there's uh, a match. Much of the relevant evidence comes from Doomsday Book, although there are some pre-conquest charters concerning lands in Staffordshire, and some relevant post-conquest sources as well. Doomsday Book is particularly useful because it often gives the holders of land at two different dates, um, in King Edward's time and in 1086, the year of the survey. 
First, a word on the shape uh, of late Anglo-Saxon Staffordshire. The Shire, as you can see from this map, takes in a varied topography, most clearly distinguished uh, between the, the moorlands, the highlands of the moorlands in the north there, uh, various plateau in the south here, you can see uh, higher land, and uh, lower lands in between and adjacent to these higher areas, drained by various rivers, most of them though tributaries of the Trent, which winds its way down through the central part of the Shire here. By the early 11th century, the Shire itself had been created and was divided into five hundreds, um, shown on this map here. So Pye Hill, Cuttleston, Sizedon, Offlow and Topmanslow in the north there. Each named after the place where the hundred court met. I'll use these hundreds in what follows as a sort of framework uh, for discussion. So first then, taking the first element of the Baxter Blair model, um, the royal cause. Um, this map shows the royal estates in each of the hundreds, and um, as I'm sure it's not particularly clear, perhaps, uh, especially from the back, I'll just try to point out the, the main features. In Pyre Hill we have two, uh, one here at Trenton, one at Stafford. Um, in Cuttleston we have one, so at Penkridge there, and uh, you may be able to see there's various different outlying parts of the estate that are indicated in Doomsday Book that I've indicated here. Um, in Sizedon we have um, two again, King Swinford down here and um, Tetton Hall here, both with some outlying parts. In Topmanslow at the top there are no royal estates and in Offlow uh, to the east uh, we have Weddensbury down here, um, Willen Hall here, which some textual evidence, which I I've, I've sort of haven't really got time to go into, um, suggests might have been part of Tetton Hall in Sizedon 100 uh, previously. So it's possible we should, we should discount that, at least uh, in the early stages of the period. Um, and over in the east there, Wigington, um, which was linked to the borough of Tamworth here on the county boundary. So two main estates in Offlow as well. So the, the pattern is that there is not simply one royal corps in each hundred, um, but there is usually one or two, and it's only Topman's Lower that doesn't have any at all. Moving on to uh, the comital estates, um, I'm including lands here that are explicitly said in Doomsday Book to have been held by the pre-conquest earls of Mercia. Those mentioned in the Doomsday Book are Earl Alfgar, who died in 1062 or 3, and his sons Earl Edwin and Earl Morcar, who were both alive in 1066 on the death of King Edward. Uh, as you can see, there are more of them than there are royal estates. Uh, in Pyre Hill, we have a couple near Trenton, um, Wolstanton and uh, Penkel, and a couple down here towards Stafford um, at Sandon and Chartley. In Cuttleston, uh, we have this very obvious large estate at Bradley, uh, with lots of dependent members around it, as well as several others around the edges of the hundred, uh, so at Mere Town, Sheriff Hales, and Cannock and Rugeley in the east there. At uh, Sizedon, um, we have again quite a few uh, commental estates. Um, in fact, I won't go through all their names, otherwise it could turn into a list, a list of names. In Topmanslow, um, we do have, again, several comital estates, perhaps making up for the fact there are no royal estates there, either confined uh, to the, the line of the River Dove here, or Leek up in the moorlands up there. And finally, in Alderous, again, we have quite a few um, royal esta uh, comital estates, uh, a lot of them in the River Valley of the Trent, um, just... Um, down here. The general pattern then um, is of several comital estates, not necessarily, not necessarily related to each other uh, in each hundred, although some may have been, there might be connections between them that we can't actually see in Doomsday Book, um, and they don't necessarily occupy a particular zone in each hundred. Some of them are quite scattered. Um, but they do serve to round out the distribution of elite land holding uh, within the Shire, filling in the gaps and the spaces around the royal cause. It's not possible entirely to distinguish 
those estates that might have been held as part of an official earldom uh, from those held as more personal possessions by the earls. Although Stephen Baxter has suggested that those recorded as in the hands of Earl Alfgar in 1066, and you remember Alfgar died in 1062 or 3, uh, may have been taken back into the king's protection after the earl's death and had not yet been granted out to another holder by 1066, which might be why they're therefore recorded under his name for that year. Uh, they were still essentially property of the earldom. Some of uh, the estates um, that the earls held by Bookland we can identify. Bookland, land held by charter in Staffordshire, uh, takes various forms. First, and most notably, the Bishop of Lichfield, or the Bishop of Chester as he was by 1086, possessed several large estates across the county. Um, I'm classing these as bookland because they probably originated perhaps as early as the 7th century uh, in grants by charter, um, royal grants by charter to previous bishops. This map, um, which comes as do several of the maps I'm using tonight from the Staffordshire Historical Atlas, uh, doesn't show all the bishops' estates, but it does show, does show two of the most impressive. Lichfield, where the cathedral was down here, and Eccleshall up here. And as you can see, the estate centre in each case has several or many outlying parts uh, or members. Given that book land is basically land granted by charter, any land for which a charter survives was probably bookland, considered as bookland during the period under discussion, at least um, during the period in which the charter was in use. In Staffordshire, the surviving charters um, mostly represent the archives of two important monasteries in the Shire. That at Burton-on-Trent, over here, uh, founded by an elite nobleman named Wolfrich Spot around the year 1000, and that at Wolverhampton, down here, founded by Wolfrich's mother, Wolverham, a little earlier. The estates left by Wolfrich uh, to support his foundation at Burton are listed in his will. Interestingly, whilst a significant proportion of these appear in the monastery's section of the Doomsday Survey, others had by then found their way into the hands of other people. Quite a few were in fact held by the Comital family, the Earls, uh, at 1066. Thanks to Wolfrich's will then and the Burton Archive, we have a way to distinguish at least some of those estates held by the Earls as bookland, and uh, they are, in many cases, these ones uh, in this area here, near to Burton on Trent. Don't worry about the different colours on this map, by the way. Each, each one represents uh, a charter that we have. The colour coding is simply to, um, to show whether we possess a boundary clause or not in each case. The surviving charters in Staffordshire probably do not represent all of the non-episcopal bookland held in the Shire by the mid-11th century, but perhaps they represent a sizable part of it. As we might expect, it's concentrated around the two monasteries in the south and the east of the county. If we move on then to, the, uh, to Baxter and Blair's zone of ministerial tenure, the evidence for such tenure in their case study was taken largely from Doomsday Book, which gives a list of the king's ministry, or thanes, for each shire, and from evidence from post-conquest sergeanty tenures as well, that is, lands held in return for some service or other. I should note that here, uh, where 1066 information is given in the Doomsday Survey, whether for the king's ministry or lands later held by sergeanty, the holder, the holder, even in the Oxfordshire case study that they use, was sometimes explicitly said to hold freely. This therefore raises the question as to whether Baxter and Blair thought these lands were nevertheless still ministerial in some way uh, before the conquest, or whether their ministerial zone is a substantially post-conquest phenomenon created out of previously freely held lands. Um, if they do believe that uh, these lands were ministerial before the conquest, it raises fairly obscure questions about the difference between loan land, um, which was represented by explicit statements of unfree tenure in Doomsday Book, people didn't hold freely, they couldn't go with their land where they would. Um, the difference between that, loan land, and this so-called ministerial tenure, which apparently at least sometimes uh, was not classed as unfree land. This issue is a particular moment in Staffordshire. In the list of King's Thanes there, uh, of 16 entries, 
uh, that give a, a 1066 holder of that land, eight, so half of those entries, explicitly state that the holder was free. And the other half of those entries are non-committal about that. They neither say that the holder was free or unfree. So what can we make of this? It's certainly possible that most of these ministerial lands were post-conquest creations made by turning freely held lands into dependent tenures. Indeed, it's surely not really possible to suggest that lands explicitly held to, uh, said to be held freely in 1066 were in some way ministerial without making a nonsense of the Doomsday Survey's tenure classifications more generally. But can later sergeanty tenures help us here? I'm afraid I've not finished accounting for these yet throughout the Shire, but there is a small uh, case study I can share with you uh, in the north of the county that sheds light on some possibilities. Newcastle under, name was, uh, under, under Lyme was named after a castle built there in the late 11th or early 12th century. And in 1236, a survey of the king's lands recovered, uh, recorded a collection of estates in the surrounding area that were held by service at the castle, as shown here, mostly castle guard duties. A slightly earlier survey in 1212 recorded the same lands as a group but called them soak lands, royal soak lands, and did not explicitly record any services at the castle. Looking back further then, uh, at the Doomsday Survey, we find that most of these estates were held by Richard the Forester in 1086, so had a collective identity there as well. And almost all the estates are listed with a 1066 holder, and almost all of these are said to have been held freely. So, in this case, classic sergeanty tenure, tenure uh, in return for service, is not explicitly recorded until 1236. Before this, the lands are not held explicitly for service, but are explicitly held as soak lands in 1212, and most had freeholders in 1066. Richard the Forester was forester of Cannock Forest in the south of, of the county, um, and it's just possible that his holdings in North Staffordshire uh, were intended to support the creation of a forest there, later appearing in the sources as the New Forest, but this can be little more than speculation, really. So what of uh, other freely held estates in the Shire? This is a, a category that Baxter and Blair don't really cover. Well, these are scattered throughout the Shire, but especially in its central and western reaches. They're represented on this map by the small red crosses, and you can see that they sort of dominate the western half of the Shire and are, are less frequent uh, in the east. This distribution compares uh, well with the distribution of place names in Toon, um, Old English uh, for farmstead or settlement, suggesting that they had a significant role in the creation of the medieval settlement pattern. And uh, there's a map of, again, the blue crosses represent uh, the Toon element in place names. And if I just flick back uh, and forward between those two maps, you can see that they largely cover the same areas of the Shire. These freely held estates are therefore an important class of estate within the Shire, at least numerically speaking, and it's quite possible that other estates for which free tenure is not explicitly stated were also nevertheless held freely. There is hardly any use of formula in the Staffordshire Doomsday that explicitly refers to dependency, dependent tenure. So in summary then, at the end of all that, we can identify large royal core estates in the Staffordshire Hundreds, sometimes more than one, um, and once uh, none at all, and some significant comital estates around these, some of which can be shown to have been bookland. We can also see several other booklands in Staffordshire, most notably those of the bishopric and of the monasteries at Burton and Wolverhampton, but there may have been more. In serious contrast to the Baxter Blair model, pre-conquest loan lands are very hard to locate, whilst freely held lands are numerous. And this is a crucial point to which I'll return. Briefly then, how do these distributions fit with Staffordshire's topography? As we might expect, the estates recorded in, in Doomsday Book are mostly found on the easily worked, or the more easily worked, loamy soils, um, so represented by this pale yellow colour here. Um, whether they are sandy or clayey loams, or a mixture of the two, the sandy and clay you can see are simply striped. Settlement seems to avoid the heavy clays of Needwood over here and the peaty soils of the highlands in the moorlands up here, as well as the acidic sandy soils on Cannock Chase and some of the plateau in the south of the county. 
Estates also seem to congregate in the river valleys. Uh, they avoid the hilltops of the moorlands and the southern plateaus. There is certainly a correlation between the elite estates of kings, bishops and earls and some of the best riverside and easily farmed locations in the Shire. But the general distribution of all the estates points to the importance of successful farming in their location. A map of doomsday estates according to their ploughland assessment, so their potential for arable cultivation, matches well with the soil distribution map. Again, sort of this, this western side of the Shire is very much more in evidence. And then we have some uh, in the river valleys on the eastern boundaries of the Shire. It would be foolish to rule out entirely the influence of organised royal patronage on estate location as promoted by Baxter and Blair. But the relationship between estate location and soils and topography demonstrate that the king and his officials had to work within a framework defined by the ease with which a given estate could successfully maintain its central household. So, given that, is it possible to say anything about the extent to which royal engagement with other landholders was planned and organised during the later Anglo-Saxon period? Well, here it will be useful to consider the creation of the Shire and its hundreds. We have already seen that all but one of the hundreds in 1066 contained one or more large royal estates, and all contained several comital estates, which could be an aspect of conscious planning. After all, it was presumably initially in intended that each hundred would render various dues, uh, together with the judicial profits from the hundred court, to a royal centre, and the earls might hope to hold fairly extensive lands across their territories. The locations of the hundred courts also hint at the importance uh, of the royal centres, as in each case they, they appear to be positioned to provide easy access from the local royal estate or estates. Uh, they're represented on this map by little yellow stars, which I'll point out to make clearer. In Pyre Hill, we have Pyre Hill here, uh, midway between Stafford and Trenton. In Cuttleston, where Penkridge is the only royal estate, uh, the Cuttle Stone is right next door. Um, in Sizedon, we have these two royal estates, King Swinford and Tetton Hall, and again, um, the meeting place is roughly halfway between them. Um, slightly pushed westward perhaps to acknowledge this collection of estates here. In Offlow again we have the meeting place here lying between Tamworth over here and at Wensby down here. Uh, the Bishop's Cathedral at Litchfield was here so that might sort of add a third uh, point in which it was related. Um, Topman's Low is difficult, it's here right on the edge, uh, seemingly um, not really related to anything, but I do wonder perhaps if it was intended to be easily accessible from Pyre Hill next door. Um, that's speculation, I can't that, but that one's a problem, I think. Um, <laughs> the rest of the pattern works quite nicely, but that one's uh, rather odd <laughs> up in the north there. Uh, it is, yes, essentially. <laughs> The total hidage of the Shire in 1086 uh, was also uh, indicates a sort of central planning, if you like, because it has 514.845 hides, um, according to my calculations anyway, uh, very close to the 500 hides you might expect because there are 500s in the Shire. Um, however, we can also identify the effects of local conditions on this administrative framework. The individual hundreds do not each contain 100 hides, even though their total is close to that. Instead, the hides are distributed unevenly between the hundreds. Now, this is actually fairly common across the Midlands, uh, despite the oft-repeated idea that hundreds in this region of the Kingdom of England contain 100 hides. Um, given this fact, it can be proposed that the sheriff administered his office at the level of the shire, where he knew he had to manage around 500 hides, rather than at the level of each individual hundred. Two factors can be suggested to account for the uneven distribution uh, among the hundreds. One is tenurial, the other to, uh, topographical. First, the hundreds appear to have been defined in part around existing estate boundaries. The large Episcopal estates at Litchfield and Eccleshall here are useful examples, as they both have edges that are followed by the hundred boundary, which I've put on sort of selectively on this map. So, the 100 boundary here seems to follow the southern edge of Eccleshall's estate. The 100 boundary here seems to follow the western edge of Litchfield's estate. Other cases, though, are less convincing. For example, an estate recorded in the Doomsday Book at Essington, down here, the green blob, 
um, had a detached portion at Bushbury in the neighbouring hundred of Sizedon. It's difficult to know what to make of this, though, as the estate could have been formed after the hundred bound, uh, boundary was created. In any case, existing patterns of tenure may well have um, played important roles in defining the boundaries of the hundreds. The topographical element uh, in these boundaries can be illustrated particularly well um, if we look at the boundary between Offlo and Cuttleston hundreds, uh, Offlo hundred here, and Cuttleston and Sizedon hundreds, I should say, here. This follows, or tends to follow, the high ground of the southern plateaus in this area and of Cannock Chase up here. And it's possible that this follows an earlier boundary between the administrative, administrative divisions of the earlier Mercian kingdom uh, called the Tom Siter and the Penka Siter. Indeed, the administrative arrangements that immediately preceded the creation of the Shire and its hundreds may have followed the same boundary. Uh, the so-called contributory manners of Stafford and Tamworth boroughs, that is rural manners um, which received dues from burgage plots within the boroughs, may have originated as early elements in the defence of those boroughs and, though, and, and thus indicate uh, earlier territories uh, that were administered from the boroughs. This indicates that Stafford was served um, by a territory comprising the later hundreds of Pyre Hills, Cuttleston and Sizedon, and that Tamworth uh, was served by Offlow and also uh, northern parts of Warwickshire. Topographical considerations might also therefore play a part in defining hundred boundaries. So far, I've attempted to show that it's possible to see the presence of royal organisation in the hundred system in Staffordshire and that some of the commodal estates represent the components of an extensive earldom that stretched across much of the northwest Midlands, certainly beyond the, the, the boundaries of the Shire. So much would tally reasonably well with the Baxter Blair model. However, I've also tried to demonstrate how the agricultural logic of these estates also contributed to much, uh, to much of their distribution. Most importantly, there is a, wide class, a widespread class of freely held estates that do not fit into their model because they are explicitly not held dependently from the local royal or comital centre. Indeed, given the overall distribution, it's easier to think of these freely held estates as those of people able successfully to maintain a household of sufficient size to merit recognition at the local hundred court, therefore giving us the distribution that matches so well with the topography and the soils. At this point, we need to think a little bit more about the general character of freely held estates below the, the level of the king and the earl. As David Roth in particular has made clear, such estates appear to have rendered various dues and services to local central estates, often those of the king or the earl. Such dues and services are often commonly labelled under the umbrella term soak. Soak could, could include tributes in cash or kind, as well as services such as carrying messages, uh, guard duties, helping to build hunting lodges or market stalls, and various light agricultural services as well. In some of the northern counties uh, in Doomsday Book, these structures, called soaks, are explicitly indicated with the manorial centre, the central estate, distinguished from its soakland estates. But most of the book does not distinguish lands in this way. It should be noted that such dues and services do not make the Soakland estates dependent or ministerial in any sense, at least not in the way intended by the concept of loan land. These are freely held estates that happen to owe um, these services to royal and commodal centres. Nevertheless, some of the services associated with such freely held lands are very like those associated with the later sergeanty tenures, such as guard duty, for example. It's therefore possible that we should blur the distinction between these freely held estates on the one hand and so-called ministerial estates, or whatever they might be. Such ministerial services were owed as part of the normal soak dues rendered by some free lands. Now, identifying the central estates of Soaks and their Soakland estates around them in the shires that don't uh, feature Doomsday Book's helpful aids is not an exact science. Royal and commonal estates can often be assumed to have acted as such central Soak estates, 
Bookland estates are also thought to have acted as, as such centres because a charter appears to have given the holder the right to keep the soaked dues and services that would otherwise have gone out of the estate elsewhere. Otherwise, it's possible to use a varied collection of indicators to reconstruct soak centres and their soak lands. For example, the parish of a church at a soak centre might take in the soak land estates as well as the central estate. This attempt at reconstructing soaks in Staffordshire shows what might be possible, and I could actually have filled in some of the gaps that are left if I'd made a few more additional assumptions as well. Um, it's the same map you've seen previously marking the Royal and Commodal Estates, uh, but the colours are intended to show the kind of Soakland territories from which those estate centres uh, drew dues and services from the surrounding freely held estates. Um, the blue represents the estates of the Bishop of Lichfield, and the yellow represents uh, Bookland estates from the uh, evidence of charters. And finally, these orange ones down here represent estates that were explicitly said in Doomsday Book to be held with sake and soak, um, which is often thought again to have given the holder the right to hold on to the soak dues that would otherwise have gone to the local centre. So what conclusions then can I draw from all of this? Well, let us return to the question of royal patronage. A widespread consensus regarding these soaks is that they were once larger but during the 10th and 11th centuries they began to fragment as kings and earls granted away pieces of them to their thanes, creating a halo of smaller manors around the old centres. Now a good example of this is provided by Cuttleston 100, uh, this 100 here, um, where the royal estate at Penkridge, in the centre there, has enough outlying parts to suggest that it could once have covered the whole of the 100, and the comital and freely held estates around it could have been carved out of it. Similar stories could be invented around the other royal centres of Staffordshire. And this process is indeed invoked by Baxter and Blair to explain the pattern they've identified in Bampton 100 in Oxfordshire. However, this doesn't really make sense of the distribution of freely held estates, which matches the soilscape and the topography very well. This suggests that freely held lands emerged where they could be agriculturally supported. If the process of their emergence was more directly linked to conscious, planned royal patronage, we might expect some element of mismatch with the distribution of natural resources. Furthermore, the idea that the free estates were the result of royal and comital grants at one time or another doesn't tally with what we think we know about them. That is, unless they were bookland, they continued to owe dues and services to the centre. Crucially, they still existed in 1066 and can be at least partially reconstructed, as I've tried to do here. Bookland is uh, the exception to this, of course, because it did take land out of this soak framework. However, although it's certainly probable that we're missing some booklands on this map, we would have to be missing an awful lot of it if it was to dominate the Shire and render the soak networks insignificant. As it is, the soak networks, illustrated uh, by the sort of purple and red uh, areas are quite a significant part of the overall area of the Shire. Now Staffordshire is only one county and any model derived from its study must be tested elsewhere. Nevertheless I think it's possible to propose that the model of royal patronage resulting in the fragmentation of large soaks can be questioned on the basis of this case study. Such a model seeks to explain a particular pattern as the result of a process happening over a period of time. It is diachronic in its place, we might put a synchronic hypothesis. Essentially, this would propose that soaks did not start out large and fragment later, but that the varied patterning of royal centres, comital estates and freely held lands, all interlinked, interlocked together, remained fairly constant over, ve uh, over relatively long periods, at least in terms of its general character, perhaps even originating in the 6th or the 7th centuries evolving and developing in its specifics, due amongst other things, certainly to the workings of royal and lordly, and lordly patronage, but also uh, to the workings of inheritance, for example, marriage or forfeiture, and certainly not moving from some kind of initial theoretical unity to ultimate fragmentation. That said, in an effort to have my cake and eat it, I think we can still see some form of transformation in the later 10th century, the middle of the period I'm looking at tonight. 
the establishment of the shires and the hundreds must have refocused local relationships to a significant degree. Whilst we can see how the framework of these new institutions was the result of negotiation, mapping central royal requirements onto locally specific circumstances, what did change was the locus of local recognition. Let me explain what I mean by that. Before the hundreds existed, landholders' claims to their land would probably be established before the gathered population of their soak the Soak territory, the other landholders within it forming a kind of group. Once the hundreds were established, the hundred court became the local court before which land claims would be acknowledged. However, hundreds included more than one Soak, as you can see from this map, and this gave landholders within the Soaks an alternative locus for the recognition of their claims. Indeed, from the reign of King Edgar, in the, uh, in the later half of the 10th century, all free men had to find themselves a lord to stand as surety for them at the Hundred Court. This enabled landholders to find a lord who would protect their interests against those of their old soak lords, if necessary, as Stephen Baxter has demonstrated. But it also burdened these landholders with the obligation to play such political games in the first place. It's often claimed that the Norman conquest and its aftermath witnessed a depression in the status of many amongst the so-called free peasantry. But I wonder if this change began earlier. The patterns of tenure recorded in Doomsday Book for 1066 might already have been the result of a kind of polarisation of landholders. The free landholders were those who were successfully playing the hundredal political game, balancing their own freedom in the hundred court against their obligations to the lord who had their soak. Whilst many of the villains working on their estates might well have been descended from those who hadn't been so skilled or so lucky during the previous century or so, and whose lands had been integrated into those of their neighbours by 1066. That is possibly more than one case study uh, should be asked to bear, so I think I'd better leave it there for now. But thank you very much for listening. Well, thank you very much.